All right, guys, I had to take a break from the interview. I'm going to put this in the beginning of the video. I um, hear, Hearing this interview kind of triggered a few things in me that I haven't thought about in a very long time and some things that have been kind of been bothering me for a little bit now. Um, and so I had to kind of take take a step back and, and get my head straight and screwed on. Um, I apologize to Zach saying, you know, I was saying, I was saying I didn't like his voice or it was a little annoying and whatnot, but uh, I apologize for that, man. I said what I said, but I do apologize. Um, yeah, as you guys, you know, watch this, you'll, you'll kind of see some of the things that might've been triggered. Um, but for now, um, we're going to keep going with the interview. Yeah, I had to, I had to clear my head. This is a brand new landscape for me. Uh, brand new landscape doing online things. You know, I've learned to manage my anxiety pretty well just in regular life. Uh, but going into the internet space is a whole new way to navigate. So I'm still figuring out how to navigate and I'll figure it out. Um, but ultimately, I'm going to stick with it, period. Um, you know, I don't care if I make crappy reaction videos for three years straight. Eventually, I'm going to figure the shit out. So um, we're going to keep going here um, with the interview. All right, guys. You guys said to check the Zack Sang interview out. I've never seen Ren in an interview. I've never seen him just kind of like talking. I've, I've never really seen the, um, you know, who Ren in, is as a person. Pardon me. Um, so I'm kind of curious to see, you know, what his deal is, who he is as a person. It's, it's cool to, I've gained a lot of respect for him through his music. Um, but, you know, oftentimes the music isn't a full reflection of who, who a human being is. So we're going to break this up in, a, I don't know maybe four or five parts or six we'll see but i'm gonna film it all at once and um yeah let's uh let's go from here man i'm interested hello beautiful human i am zach that is dan oh. and uh we welcome to the studio ren is here hey hello 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 Thank you for being here. It's nice to be here next to this absolutely horrifying cat pillow. <laughs> we say that about the cat, but the truth is that's like one of the most famous things about our show. Maybe one of the most famous pillows of all time, actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, many, many, uh, many people like hold it. Like they, can they, I cradle it? You can do it. Yes, whatever just... you need to feel. <laughs> Guys, I'm I'm not trying to be a dick, but his this guy's voice is a little annoying to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'll, we'll we'll move on. I know it's not positivity and everything, man, but it's I can't right now. It's just my mindset. It's like, dude, this voice is is a little much. <laughs> Safe. Yeah, this this is my emotional support pillow now. That is. Thank you. It's for your purpose. <laughs> yeah, thank you. By the way, your speaking voice is incredible. Thank uh, thank you. <laughs> you have a great tone, and it comes mm. through in the music you make because of his is not. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, man. L I'll let it go. A lot of it do is done in this in the style of poetry. Is that kind of correct, or am I totally off base? Yeah, I, I think I, I weave a lot of poetry into what I'm doing for sure. Um, a, a lot of spoken word, a lot of hip hop. I mean, some of the best hip hop it, it has its origins in that. Really, the rap, rhyme and poetry. What rap stands for. Your story is so. <laughs> Music means something really different to you. Mm. Um. And I, I think it all stems from, like, I don't even know where to begin, dude. Like, I've been listening to your music, and then I really, we have, just, your story is, like, just in our brief, it's 10 pages. Hmm. Because you've been through an exceptional amount. That's true. In a way that, like, like, people go through things all the time. And health is something that is completely and totally out of our control. But in moments where you've tried to manage and go after figuring out what was holding you back health-wise, you've just been steered in the wrong directions, which would ultimately yeah. lead to you. I mean, do you look at that today and go, I wish the doctor would have told me exactly what I needed to know at the very beginning? Or are you somewhat grateful for the journey that it's put you on? It's a, it's a difficult question, man. It's a very difficult question because it's... And I, I guess it comes back to whether you see things as a gift, gift or a curse, which is the choice. And, yeah. you know, if there was a parallel universe with a Ren that hadn't gone through those things, would I be the artist that I am? Would I be right? I wouldn't be t talking about the topics that I am, but how would the course of my life transpired? And I think it always just comes down to a choice. So you might as well choose the thing. The I would love to meet Ren, man. Um... 
the, for the people that watch my channel, they know like kind of my mentality and the way that I think about things. And like, you, you know, we all have struggles in life. And, and, you know, I talk a lot about exactly what Ren is probably about to say here, man. But um, I would love to meet Ren and, and um, I don't know, I'll probably just have a beer, you know, not even like talk serious. Just like, hey, man, you want to have a beer? <laughs> Makes you feel better about it, which is that it's a gift, right? Because if I look at it like a gift and I look at it like a press perspective, then it justifies all of that stuff happening. And it's 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 unusual to think about a parallel universe where none of those things happened because I think with that comes a little bit of negativity towards my situation now. So um, I think the decision to be grateful, is, it really serves me. The music you're making today, I mean, the album that... W is one of the big topics of discussion, Sick Boy. It, it is crafted while you're up in Canada figuring out your health, correct? For a, like a, a fourth time at this point or something. Yeah, well, so, uh, some of it was crafted before I left knowing that I was going to Canada. Some of the tracks put together then, and then there was a few tracks that I actually produced and recorded whilst, yeah, whilst in treatment there, yeah. So yeah. my understanding of the story mm. is you sign a great deal and you get addicted well let's start with the beginning you get yeah. addicted to busking yeah which i i didn't understand could be a real thing but is because it is like this instant reaction that can release something in you correct yeah i i love i love it um and it was the first thing i mean i only had ever had one job in my life when i was 16 working at a, a co-op and um i got i got fired for throwing sprouts at my co-worker <laughs> <laughs> so uh, from that moment forth, I decided that all because I mean I was obsessed with music ever since I was ten years old, and I was producing beats and selling my mixtapes at festivals as a thirteen-year-old with this little tiny handheld boombox, and I'd just go and sit by a bunch of people and play the songs, and just you know, and and I was obsessed. At school time, at dinner time, I'd lock myself in the music room. I almost forgot I was doing a reaction. <laughs> I literally forgot I was doing a reaction. Oh man! We just play pia piano the Whatever. whole time, or play guitar, and um, it was just a real hyper fixation for me. And then, um, so busking was my way of like, as a seventeen-year-old, is when I first started doing it. It was just my way of I could go out on the streets and I could do what I love. And then, you know, I wasn't making a huge amount when I first started because I hadn't quite mastered the art of performance or anything yet. But I made enough to be like, oh, cool! I can I can have a little bit of spending money from doing what I love. And and that's when I just I started pouring myself into it in the art of performance and yeah became addicted to just being out on the streets playing. And that was a, something that I just did throughout whenever I could before my health uh, declined. It was just something that I would do probably five, six days a week, I'd be out there for sometimes like six, seven hours at a time. Do you think your success in during that phase, in which ultimately leads to today, was kind of fueled by this ability to have hyperfixation on things? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, even fueled the, by ADHD? Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in those, it, it's just like my brain, which is a very common thing. So ADHD, there's a lot of new research that says it's essentially like a dopamine dependency. So you're constantly seeking these little spikes. And if you're doing something that's not giving you that spike of dopamine, you become disinterested and um, you find it very difficult to do. And um, But with music, I could sit there. It was the only thing that felt meditative for me. I could meditative. I could sit there for hours on end, producing, playing, singing, rehearsing the same lines over and over again. So um, I think it, it, 100%, and even to this day, it's the same thing. Um, it, it just, it's the one thing I can sit there happily forgetting to eat all day, um, just because it's, I just become so immersed in it. What do you learn about people from busking? So much, man. It's very, it's very interesting. My, I become fascinated with the psychology of performance. That was one of the most interesting things I learned is, um, that there are these things called mirror neurons, right? Where you, it, if you observe a behavior, you become inclined to repeat it because we're like creatures of community and we and we it's why in those talent shows when you watch somebody like gasping or crying at a moment where someone's singing you feel that emotion just by seeing that person in the crowd and it's like because your brain gets act activated to mirror those things so with busking what i found was really interesting is if you can hold just one or two people 
watching you. It instantly creates a space that's safe enough for everybody else to come and watch you. So as long mm. as you like kind of focus on focus your energy on not like, oh no, why am I not getting a crowd? Because that energy almost gets projected out. If you can capture one or two people's attention, all of a sudden that two people turn into 10, turn into 50, turn into 100, uh, just because they're enabled mm. by other people doing it. So I found that where, yeah, I, I, that probably makes me sound a little bit mental, but I, I love to people watch while I'm playing because I think it feeds into my performance while I'm doing it. I understand that. Yeah. Well, because you have the ability to react in real time and you're not necessarily focused on what you need to do next. You're focused on what they want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and it's really, I mean, and it's a positive feedback loop, right? Because if, if you are, if you, you're holding, because the good thing about busking as well is people are, are there by choice. They're not, they haven't bought a ticket and if they're not enjoying it, they're just like there chatting away. The, the, the people who stop to watch you do it completely out of their own free will. So it's a really affirming thing. And then you get this positive feedback loop, which helps me almost forget myself which is almost my constant goal as a performer is get rid of the thinking mind get rid of the self-aware mind and just be doing and just mm. be and, and my favorite moments in life i almost like i almost like i don't really have much to say about this it's incredibly fascinating to actually listen to him talk um because i can i can tell through the music that there's there's thought there's a lot of thought behind it there's a lot of work behind it there's a lot of um like you said rehearsing and producing for hours and hours and hours um i i've dabbled a little bit in that kind of stuff and so i, I understand the amount of work it takes in order to produce a quality song or, or even just even just the basic song that resonates with people um and sounds good it's a lot harder than people realize so it's interesting to see, um, you know, I, I really just want to hear him hear him talk. It's fascinating for sure. Hmm. Or when I forget, almost forget my physical form and just become whatever song it is uh, and, and it kind of comes through me. Some of my favorite artists, I think, have the ability to kind of tap into that flow state like Jimi Hendrix, like Jeff Buckley, that the freedom of performance but uh, it, is, is that something you're only tapping into when you're on stage or is that something you're tapping into when you're recording in the studio mm. it's a bit it's I, I did i literally did a whole in, online course from it called flow state i've done it with my with connor who's here actually um and i try and apply it whenever i can because i think those moments where you become thoughtless even social interaction going out dancing going out partying enjoying th like running whatever when you become less self-aware things just flow much mm. nicer and i think mm. life becomes more enjoyable so it's it's constantly like a thing that i'm trying to fall into yo beautiful human real quick i, I want to tell you uh, my secret to the perfect date night for me and my boyfriend y you can steal it i will let you steal it dan i'll also let you steal it so you can do it with your girlfriend oh thank you i'm looking forward to it you guys should make a hello fresh dinner together mm, yum seriously i'm not i'm skipping it i don't i'm sorry not I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> mm. For physical health is an an album that is, you don't know, or uh, use our code fifty Zach mm. when you're checking out. So, just to like recap, mm. and, and if you don't know, we get to a place here today, and an album that is an incredibly intense journey. Yeah, like you know. One of the things we've talked about a bunch is like, it's two things, right? Like physical health is incredibly important. Mm. Equal to the importance of physical health is mental health. Yeah. And the two very much, it's like they, 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 they're they so deeply, deeply connected in mm. so many different ways. Y you end up losing a record deal early on mm. for things that are completely and totally out of your control. Yeah. You, you get sick. Does it come out of nowhere? It, it it's funny. I mean, I, I, in terms of the physical symptoms, yes. In terms of, I think, mental health and feeling like a little bit of an outlier and an outsider, I think that was just a constant theme in my life. And maybe it, maybe it set the stage for a chronic illness getting uh, a hold of my body because some people don't develop autoimmunity. Some people don't fall into it. Hi, Mark Barden at Sandy Hook Promise here. When the gunman... To a state of sorry I, I i gotta skip that um man yeah i know people who who have chronic illnesses and they have their chronic illnesses are, are almost some of them are correlated with 
a, a certain emotional states or stressful events that happen in their life like their chronic illness will get much worse after a stressful event or even a stressful conversation um depending on what the illness is and um it's yeah they're very both of them are very um closely linked together for sure chronic sickness they get something like lyme disease and their body deals with it and they're okay but then you have a percentage of people who don't and there are theories as to why that ha happens so oh. i'm not i'm not sure if the dis ease in my body the disease the disease came from disease and and um and came from a, a place of discontentment because i kind of always felt that uh, I, I can't even really tell you a time not to get too heavy but mm. i can't really tell you a time where i don't think i did feel like that apart from in the recent years um when i've been picking everything apart and then putting it back together again and i've finally come to a place in my life where i'm feeling a much greater sense of peace and tranquility and by the way it's a journey of health that is it's being supported by those who appreciate and feel understood by your music mm. and you're giving and you have given them your music in return right like for gofundme donations to for treatment you would give yeah. them the album in return 100 percent, yeah and yeah, it's, it's it's so important to me. And, and now, luckily, I've gotten to a state, a place where I'm financially independent, and it feels really nice to um, be a voice for those people, be a voice for the voiceless, be somebody who can tell their story. Because my story is so many people's story. And when I started doing the health blogging before, when I was too sick to make music, I realized that there are so there is such a underground community of people who aren't seen, who are just suffering under the surface because they're they're not dealt with properly by the medical industry but they're too sick to really speak up about it so it feels really nice and empowering to be in a position where i can tell their story too and in a nutshell you were wrongly diagnosed like they thought you had something called me yeah yeah well i was first initially diagnosed with bipolar um which was a misdiagnosis because my symptoms would come cycl cyclically and in waves when I wasn't looking after myself or when I was eating the wrong thing, but I didn't know that at the time. But that's also connected. Diet, guys. Diet, diet, diet. Okay, like in our, in our genetics, these foods, I mean, I'm drinking an energy drink while I'm doing this, okay? So I, I understand, you know, whatever, man. But diet, exercise like live as close as you can genetically to your ancestors because a lot of this stuff that's come around it's it's new our bodies don't know what it is and, and chronic illnesses and a lot of mental health disorders are exacerbated dramatically by um by our diets and our lifestyle 100 percent to the lyme disease yeah exactly but i didn't know that so they were like oh well some days you feel a bit better some days you feel like really com like mentally foggy brain confused and they're like well it sounds like hypercycling bipolar so i was put on citalopram i was put on um some different ssris which made me a lot worse because uh, i had uh, underlying mcas which is this allergic condition but i didn't know that at the time either so i just fought through it because i was like well the doctors tell me if i it will even out eventually and i'll be fine eventually man yeah, so I mean, I I've been mis like I've been misdiagnosed with bipolar depression, um, you know, I mean, je je uh, what is it called? Major depressive seasonal like I've been misdiagnosed with a lot of mental health stuff that was, I mean, extreme anxiety essentially is is what I've I deal with, um, you know, stemming from childhood trauma. It took you know it took to me about 10 years of dealing with that kind of like therapists psychiatrists um i've you know i've been on like 10 different psych meds um at different points in my life i think at the most i was on like five um and it's not a glorification man like the, there's a kind of a trend to to glorify uh mental i mean there should be an awareness but the, i do i feel like I, I see some things and i'm like this doesn't feel right like it seems like there's a glorification or people are saying this to get fucking props to get fucking likes to get like you should i don't know man this shit i i won't bang on about that but um <laughs> yeah man for for people who have because it's it's not ren it's not me it's 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 who knows how many probably probably millions of people who have dealt with medical misdiagnoses um psychological mental misdiagnoses um it's a real thing. So, yeah, thank God for Ren, man, for at least being um, kind of a public voice for that. Because it's, 
it's a it's an incredibly common thing um let's keep going because i was like well the doctor's telling me if i it will even out eventually and i'll be fine eventually and so i just went through the mill with all these things um valium was the worst one because of the withdrawals but i, yeah. I just went i went I, I was bouncing from doctor to doctor and then eventually as i was deteriorating they said well you're tired loads of the time you're in pain maybe it's like me fibromyalgia and then I, I'm on a waiting list for a year and I finally get to see that doctor and then Man. The, the, the treatment is resting more. And it's like, <laughs> what? I've been in... Man, my fucking heart. Because I've been through some of the similar things, man. Everyone's experience is different, but it, it it's nice to hear, like, it's honestly nice to hear somebody who's who's been through similar things where it's like, I, I don't talk about, like, if you go through my channel, I mention things occasionally, but I really don't talk about it. I'll probably be talking about it a lot more in this reaction than any of my other reactions. I don't talk about it much, but um, a lot of it is because it's like, man, I don't know, like, it, it's it's a very unique experience, in specifically dealing with the medical industry. Um, and so, in my own mind, I know there a lot of people are going to comment and say, well, like, oh, it's more common than you think. I understand that. And, you know, maybe I should be more open about it. But I, I really don't want to, like, I don't want to build a channel off of, like, people coming because I, I talk about my mental health. Like, I don't want to glorify it, okay? I would love to give pointers. I would like to say, like, hey, diet, extra, like, give pointers and be like, guys, there are some things you can do. Like, hey, I relate to this song. That's great and all. Um, I'm fine with doing that and I do that, but I also do like comedic reactions. I do a bunch of other stuff. Um, I just, I fear becoming one of those, like, I don't, I don't want somebody to look at it and be like, man, this guy, not even necessarily somebody looking at it. I don't want to get subscribers and likes and views off of talking about my mental health, you know, in my experience of it. I mean, I don't know. You guys, give me the, in the comments, eventually the comments balance out and people start really getting at the root issue. So please feel free to comment and like, you know, ex like, like, tell me what you think about this. Um, let's keep going here. I actually, I got to pee quick. All right, let's keep going here. It is resting more and it's like, <laughs> I've been in bed for, it's honestly, it's, it's really, it's the, the, the level of care is so bad for people who go through those things. So. You know, I, I was really hopeful for this appointment for a whole year, went to the appointment and it was just really disappointing. And, and, and that was a cycle that went on for years of just like getting my hopes up for something and then getting my hopes obliterated and, and my physicality being worse off. And it was something that I had to constantly pick myself up from the ground uh, until the point of breaking point in 2015, where it kind of culminated in going into fully blown psychosis. Cause I just, I think my brain had just had enough. Well, and you literally tried to do everything at one mm. point. I mean, you explore fecal transplants. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the, uh, that was the highlight of my life. That was having somebody else's, uh, excrement oh, put in my, my backside was, um, Yes, what a what a journey that was, and that was that was it was another thing because there's a lot of science behind it, right? So you're you're implementing your someone else's microbiome into your mm. own. So it, at the time, I was like, because I had so many digestive problems, I was like, maybe it's gut based, and maybe it's just like this dysbiosis that's yeah. throwing my whole body off. So, and one of the most researched things, and it was it was healing things like Crohn's disease, it was healing yeah. a lot of autoimmune conditions, even MS was being slowed down by having these fecal transplants. So. You know, my music wasn't known at the time. I, I spent six months raising six thousand pounds, which was the the price of it. You know, don't come from come from a poor family, so they couldn't help me. So I had to do it myself. Really, I, I started doing these health blogs and reaching out to the chronically ill community. And eventually, I raised the money. And there was so much hope. This is this is just before the psychosis. There was so much hope for that six months. I, at the time, I was so ill and so underweight that I couldn't get out of bed. So that whole six months I was in bed, maybe I'd get up and have a shower every few days, but even that was pretty excruciating. And, and then, this is before you know you have Lyme, right? This is before I know I have Lyme disease, yeah. So so I, I raise the money, I go to stay in this clinic and we do 10 days of uh, the fecal transplant thing and then my body had an autoimmune reaction to it and it made my symptoms like about five times worse. And hmm. that for, I think for the level of hope that I had, um, it, it was like one of the most crushing things ever. And And then... It was it was a few weeks after that that um, uh, it, it was the start of the Seven Sins song. I was literally lying on the kitchen floor, like with my hands, um, sort of like with my nails digging into the floor because it, it was in so much pain and so much 
uh, I don't know, just, just, uh, I was just so bitter about, about the fact that you're, you have your sight set on this thing, you do this thing and then it, it not only does it not work, but it makes you worse. Mm. And, um, yeah, I just remember this thing and then my mum came down, she could, she, she came down the stairs and saw me in this state and then I just felt myself, it was really strange, I kind of felt myself fall through this tunnel, it was almost like quite a spiritual experience mm. and, um, all of a sudden it just like, all that pain and everything, it just, there was, it's it so, so bizarre. I don't, I still can't really understand what happened, but it's like all my pain stopped, all my, all the weird feelings stopped, and I just felt this weird sense of euphoria. And I came to, I remember looking around and I, I developed this, this tick, which was like a click in my hands. And, um, I, I kept doing it, but I was speaking really eloquently to my mum and, and almost like really wittily, witty and funny. And she was kind of like nervously laughing at all the things I was saying. I can't really quite remember what I was saying, but I was in this kind of like manic euphoric state. Um, and then like loads of uh, strange, I started having loads of strange behaviours. Like I went down into the living room and I couldn't stand the fact that no, everything wasn't parallel. So I'd move everything parallel. And then, um, and then it kind of culminated in me. Well, that was the first, there was a few days of euphoria and then it turned into just like this, intense feeling of dread that I couldn't explain. And I'd wake up at like 3 a.m. sometimes like screaming as loud as I could, like literally scream. My mum would run in, it'd be like these night terror things. Hmm. And then my my communication went the opposite way and I, I couldn't really communicate what was happening. And I developed a vocal stutter where I'd get stuck on words for maybe two minutes. So it'd be like just again and again and again. And then um, I, I, I started becoming quite delusional and thinking that the only explanation for my health struggles could be demonic or some sort of experiment. It was like the only thing that my mind at the time, a rational mind, made sense. Yeah. And um, uh, there was a time where I I decided that the only way to short circuit my reality. <laughs> was to do the thing that was least expected of me. And this one time I, while I was in the car with my mum, I jumped out the car on a road. I ran into the road and I took off all my clothes and I just lay it in the middle of the road and caused a traffic jam while I was like laughing hysterically at the sky because I thought this is the last thing they expect. And if I do this, then the, the, all of this is gonna stop. And then the police came up and luckily my mum talked me out of getting sectioned and um, yeah, that, that, that was about three months where I was wow. just in this really intense, psychosis that was wow. really fueled by this one treatment that like really i mean because it's such intense pain yeah that you you don't even know how to compute it yeah like you're still alive but you're feeling like you're it's like your body's breaking down but like i you you, you mentioned that you there's a song about that moment when you're in, on the kitchen floor yeah what role does that song play in this whole process does it come to allow you to help find peace does it rationalize and help you understand does it, like what it, what does that song I, I, mean i think i think when because right at the start it has this like welsh choir which is almost like a eulogy to myself and i was setting the scene with that it's just because that moment was such a prominent moment that always sticks in my mind that it, it 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 wasn't i don't even know if it was catharsis it was just to tell the story in in its rawest form without sugarcoating it just making it as much as a window and as much as a transparent window as it could be. What is it like to go back to that? Not that comfortable always, no. I, I, you know, uh, but it's, it's something I've spoken about and it's something I've spoken in therapy about. And, you know, uh, it, it's still important for me. I think there's an, uh, there's an element of PTSD through, throughout the years because it literally does feel like you're being tortured. Like when you're... Um, mm. Sorry. <laughs> when you when you're lying in bed for that long it it does feel like you're being tortured and and your 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 captor is um you don't you, you don't know when it's going to stop if ever and mm. and then then life seems a bit a bit pointless because you see you know all, all the people that I grew up with doing their thing getting married uh getting jobs doing the the, the thing and I, I didn't really have a 20 so it was um yeah, it, it's 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 quite difficult, but um, but it, it feels, d despite despite the element of PTSD, that I think there's, it it it's really important for me, because, I, I'm probably a lucky very small percentage, of people who have managed to, climb out of that place, and and some people don't ever climb out of that place, so.
that's an important thing, man. A lot of people, um, I mean, not being sure of when it's going to stop. And, and the, to me, when I was in a cycle of, um, I mean, when I was stuck, um, you know, it definitely not knowing when it's going to stop or is it ever going to get better. That's one of the most daunting things, um, that can keep you down. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, like he mentioned, you know, your, your friends or, you know, people you went to school with, they're off going to college, they're off getting jobs, you know, doing, doing whatever they're doing. And you're, you're kind of still trying to figure out how to, um, you know, it's, it, Ren's experience seems to be a little bit different in that it's, it's more medical, but, um, you know, a lot of the principles still apply. I mean, you're, you're trying to figure out how to get better or how to manage to just do basic things. Um, yeah, let's, let's just keep going here, guys. It's really important to, for me to tell their story in hopes the more awareness comes and in hopes. Oh, um, yeah, a big thing is, um, I mean, I, I did a lot of like, um, inpatient, outpatient, um, mental health treatments and, um, I met, you know, a good amount of people throughout that. And there are some people that I met in that who have kind of made it out and they're doing better. Um, I'm one of those people who's kind of learned how to manage my anxiety to the point where I can sit in front of a camera and talk about mental health. There was a point in time I, I didn't want to have a picture taken. Like it, it was too much. Point being, um, there are some people, um, you know, I, I befriended different people in these, um, you know, groups and inpatient and and the other thing, too, is when you're like if you ever go to a mental health um, facility or, or whatever, and let's say you're, you're self-admitted uh, inpatient and it like let's say it's a therapy, you're lucky enough to get into a therapy program. The people that you meet there who are also in the same position as you who are like I, I like inpatient is for people who are like I literally want to kill. It's not like. Oh man, I want to kill myself. It's like, no, I, I literally have a plan or I've attempted to, or like I, I need to literally be put in a facility that's nerfed so I can't kill myself. Um, when you go into a facility like that, you meet a lot of people and, and you do bond very quickly with those people. Um, and so I've, I've met some people who their lives have improved and their lives have gotten better, but I, I honestly, it's, it's sad, but the vast majority of them are either still in drug addiction, still their mental health rules them, or um, I, I've had friends who I've met in that scenario who killed themselves six months later. Um, <clears throat> and that's that's the reality of it. So you know, I, I it might be triggering, it might be this and that. You know, I'm I'm not here to cater to people's sensitivities i mean this is you know my real experience and there are people that i've met in that situation where they um you know they tragically took their own lives six months later and um you know it, it leaves a hole in your life you know you, you definitely it, it's hard but there's so many people who their stories are kind of lost now uh, um i don't want to say they're lost because they they live on through us in a way but they those those people are gone that like who they are is is dissipated into whatever's in the next realm and um you know it's very important what he's saying is i mean ren's been fortunate at, like like i'm blessed i'm fortunate ren is blessed he is fortunate to be able to make it through something like that and see the not only get to a point where you can even see the light in the you know at the end of the tunnel but even start to inch towards it and crawl towards it and eventually run towards it um, what he's saying is incredibly important. Not everybody gets that. Um, I know, I know people who were going through the same things, um, I was that are dead now. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's the sad reality of it. Um, whether it's drug addiction, suicidal ideation, both, um, you know, the mental health disorder and, um, disorders and, um, you know, drug addiction go hand in hand. And um, I'm not like, it, it, you know, I will say this about using that terminology. Some some people may 
watch this and say, you know, mental health disorder is a, you know, it's a negative term. It's, it's, it's like the whole unliving yourself. It's like, man, so we're going to spend time now talking about the terminology of something when you could be spending time and energy on, on actually addressing the issue. So like, we're going to argue about to like, I'm sorry, but it's, it's something that does frustrate me. Uh, an incredible amount because some people are are so dead set on let's art like hey don't say mental health disorder it makes people think something's wrong with them it's like well look as somebody who has something wrong with me it's a part of me ren talks a lot about acceptance and i i have to say a lot of a lot of people don't seem to want to accept that no it's, okay it's fine if if something's fucked up with you that's okay a lot of people have a lot of fucked up problems that that they kind of don't have a choice in dealing with. It's a part of them. And once you get to that point of acceptance, um, that's what's really important. And so, I, you know, I'm sorry if somebody's triggered by, you know, me saying mental health disorder. Whatever, it doesn't matter what what I'm calling it. Like, you know, the, the more people, and I'm hypocritically focusing on arguing about terminology when I could be addressing um, the actual problem, um, you know, that that is there but um yeah man props to ren for for one doing this interview and then you know two for making it through and then recognizing like y you know i'm blessed to be alive you know i've i've <laughs> you know i've um i've tried to kill myself multiple times i should be dead scientifically speaking i should not be alive um and so when, you know, a lot of the times when people have things to say on the channel, I, I do get frustrated and I do get, because people see a snippet, a 10 minute, and I'm getting better with it, but people see a 10 minute clip of, of me talking and they think they understand what I'm saying. They think they understand who I am as a human being, the struggle I've been through. I've realized not many people really understand shit about me. Um, and especially not through the medium of the internet. Um... I'm kind of turning this into a venting session, but let's let's bring it back. Um, yeah, let's bring it back. Thank you, Ren, for this. Thank you, Zach, saying even though your voice is a little bit not my favorite. Um, thank you for doing this interview, Zach, saying in all seriousness. Because they don't feel alone. Uh, I appreciate that. Mm. Uh, I lost my friend this year. She had a terminal illness. And I think people don't realize how much time you lose. Yeah. And this concept that you're a, you're a prisoner to your own fucking body. Yeah. And even though your brain can tell you one thing, your body can do something, mm. they don't they, they don't correspond. That's it. That's it. And and especially when you have a, like a part in yourself. And I'm really sorry about your friend, by the way. Really sorry. Um, Thanks. but when you have a part part inside of yourself that's um, just craves life so much, like and just wants that because you know what I mean. Because we we all want and we all deserve we all deserve it. And, and it it can feel very confusing and very uh, I, I touch on a lot of spiritual things on this album and it can be very spiritually we ask real people if we can I gotta help get them premium, share surprise man. with someone they love cool box I've got to get premium using um being like what is the purpose of this uh, and so coming back coming full circle to the first question and then attributing a purpose to it and then I think about that and, and I'm like, okay, I have a trip. So, so it's given it meaning, but where's the meaning for the people who don't? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. But no. where, where, where is the meaning for the people who just suffer and die with this? Like, yeah. Where, where's, like, where's the rationale in, in a spiritual sense? Like, what, what justification is there for that? Or is it just meaningless and is it just, it just what it is? And it's a very sort of like Nietzsche view of everything that is just, these things just happen it's just part of the the whole cycle of life and yeah it's it's it's, it's something that makes me i ha have a bit of a tug of war with with my own spirituality of, of what i believe and what i think and um something that i, qu I quite still haven't landed where or what or why probably eternally but um if you ever figure it out ryan let me know <laughs> let us all know man yeah it, it's uh, I hope to, in whatever way, in the path of my career, carve out a space that hopefully eases some of that suffering for people just because I know how insidious it can be.
and it's coming through in these records. Um, but one of the one of the songs of yours that it's not on this body of work, but High Ren, yeah, it, it it is so brutally honest, and it's a conversation amongst yourself. And I mean, are you crafting that record thinking back to where you were mentally at that time, or are you crafting that record from a space where, like? What you hear is what where you were. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I, th I think with that with that song, because I mean, it's impossible for my house stuff not to leak into stuff. Just it's been so so much a big part of my periphery. But it that that song was really. I mean, the core of it was really just the human plight, not the plight of the chronically ill person, but just the human plight of these two duality: the ego and the self doubt, and the the overconfidence and the over doubt. It, it was just really like the doubt of me as a creator mm. and it was quite fun actually at times for me to just poke fun at that and poke fun at myself and not take it too seriously you know and um yeah I, I and i think that's why it, it did so well because it was on a human level just relatable to a lot of i've said it in a million ren reactions yeah no thank you i think that's why it, it did so well because it was on a human level just relatable to a lot of people totally. because you don't have to have gone through a big life full of trauma to be able to to have a voice inside that's like you can't do that especially in today's age man like with like the barrage of like we're we're put under a microscope and we've all yeah, social okay. media has made us all performers like all of us are now entertainers because we're all just showing little snippets of our lives um which i think is a new thing for the human brain to process and get to terms Very with new. like being so Very, oh my god ren i'm so glad i did this yeah, man, it's so new to the human. All of this is so new to the human being, uh, human brain. Man, observed makes you very self-aware, and within that realm of self-awareness, becomes a lot of self-criticism, right? So, um, and I think that's why. And also, as well, I mean, it's a nine-minute song, which is a bit of a <laughs> bit of an antithesis. It's a bit a bit of a juxtaposition to what is successful these days, which is short. Oh my god. For those of you who watch, you know, you this is like my fucking soul right here, man. My thought like these this is my thoughts. I would love I would love to meet Ren, man. I would love to meet him. I would love to interview him. Ren, I don't even have a studio, man, but let's figure it out, man. Let's do an interview. Let's plan it. Let's get it done. Mate. You're in Canada? I'm in Colorado. It's not too far. Let's let's make something happen, man. But wow. Wow, man. TikTok culture, man. Even YouTube with the shorts. I started doing shorts like three, two, three days ago. And, you know, I'm like, man, do I really want to keep doing these? These Like, I just edit small parts of the video that I think are like highlights. And so it's, it, I'm not like creating shorts intentionally. Um, I'm just editing parts out of the video that I thought were the most entertaining but I'm like, man, I don't like, I just, I don't like it. Like, I don't like the concept of it. It's against, but it's like, man, do you have to, you know, do you, do you have to play the game to beat the game? You know, it's like, do you change the organization from the inside? It's, it's that age old conversation of, you know, can you engage in something that you believe is wrong in order to change people's thought, thoughts about it? I don't know, man. I don't know fast food content you know yeah well because you're telling a real story and honestly mm. it's so the details are so vivid mm. and the way you you produce it i just i can see you talking to yourself in a mirror you yeah. see the the duality like the two sides of you yeah yeah super wild yeah oh, thank you man thank exquisite you. song yeah really fucking exquisite <laughs> it's like no no it's really fucking good <laughs> oh man yeah that when you, <laughs> Hang on, man, I want to see that again. You yeah. see the the duality, like the two sides of you. Yeah, yeah. Super wild. Yeah, I oh, thank you, man. Thank exquisite you. song. Yeah. Really fucking exquisite. Appreciate that. When <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, can we move on? Is that a stream of consciousness, or how does that work? Nothing but love, Zach. Nothing but love, man. <laughs> it, it. I had the concept for years, actually. I just hadn't, I hadn't done anything with it. I knew I wanted to do it, and I had, I actually had a whole four minute long song which I scrapped all of the lyrics for which was a similar sort of concept but then I came back to it years later because um, you know, I'd gotten better at guitar I'd gotten better at lyric writing and I, and I was like oh I want to bring this concept to life I think it would be a really cool video 
I didn't. I, I never really expect it to go the way it did. And in the end as well, the end was a lot bleaker at the start. It ended up with me offing myself after the, after the negative voice gets too much. And I remember showing my friend and they were like, Ren, why are your songs always so bloody depressing? And I was like, <laughs> that's a good point. You know? And so I went away and thought about it, sat with it for a while. And then I wrote that last verse, which ended up being my favorite verse oh, of the song, man. which is a lot more hopeful and bringed a lot more which was actually more true to my story at the time as well. So yeah. it, it, the redemption. It was um, yeah. I, I, I'm really glad that they pulled me up on it in that way, actually, because I, I think you got you got to keep those people around you, man. Don't get people who just agree and say, "Oh, it's amazing, it's great." Find the people who say, "Hey, man, like you maybe get like what's going on with this? Like why is it why is it like this? You know, ask questions. Get people in your life who ask questions, man. Favorite thing is the the kind of acceptance of the dark and the light rather than one winning over the other because it's not even really the light winning over the dark of the, of the hope it's just more that those two things exist in parallel duality and they could exist and they should exist and they, on and they any always, given day and they always do they that's do the thing, yeah really. no it's not they could exist they do exist bro i'm sorry i'm not trying to trash zach and this man but sorry I'll, i'm sorry guys for all the zach saying fans that fans out there i'm not trying to trash him i'm just I'm passionate about this too, you know. And they could exist, and they should exist and they, and on any given day. And they always do. That's the thing. I, I, I think this. We we we're obsessed with the narrative of good versus evil in in Hollywood, in in stories and everything. And it's always like yeah. the the battle of good versus evil, and whether in a horror film or in a superhero film, one always wins. But I don't really think that's the truth. I th I think that I think that it's more akin to the yin yang symbol, where where both exist inside each other and there'll always be a place for both and a need for both what a beautiful thing to accept mm. yeah and i think that acceptance makes because i think we're such harsh critics of ourselves you know what i mean we're so and we're so hard we're so quick to point fingers at people without uh, accepting what am i doing to zach saying right now man you could point at my video and say how stupid it is this whole reaction, you could point out a million things, and I do it. I do it on my own channel. I trash my own reactions. Funny series. We're so quick to point out the uh, the uh, what somebody else is doing without recognizing in our own hypocrisy within that. I'll shut up. Um, yeah. but I do think life becomes less of a struggle when when you you don't see as things as this is good, this is bad, this is black, this is white, because I think when things are like that, it becomes a little bit more jarring to navigate life. Hmm. What does it feel like when you find out that you didn't have this Emmy, but you ended up having Lyme disease? It's it was a really weird one because when I first, because I went I, so 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 what happened? I, so I was in the psychosis, right? And um, I there's part of me that's still lucid, and I'm researching online, all because I'm always researching online. I took before that I was taking countless different supplements and trying different things that weren't working, but I was like. I, I found this condition, the subsect of kids with autism had this condition called PANDAS, P-A-N-D-A-S, which is caused by the streptococcus bacteria that gets inside your brain and causes all these psychotic-like symptoms. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that's with me. So I convinced my mum to take me to a gastroenterologist and I faked a stomach bug because I knew that I'd get penicillin because I was active against streptococcus. I faked this stomach bug. I go to the doctor and um, gives me, of course, and I tell him, oh, I've taken penicillin before. I cleared it right up. Gives me a course of penicillin. I get home. Never taken it before take it for two weeks and then my, my psychosis goes away and my symptoms like diminish by about 50% and I'm like, what the hell? And then they creep back up after it. And I'm like, and I've taken so many pills at this point that I know it's not placebo. So, um, because I'm, I'm no stranger to the placebo effect. And so I go, this, this is infectious. This isn't, this isn't my brain. This isn't like a miswire. This like, there's an infectious element to this because I took an antibiotic and my symptoms got better. So I, I saved up and I go and see a infectious disease specialist in Brussels. Um, about six months later and I tell him all my symptoms before he even does any blood tests he was like we're gonna do some blood tests but I'm telling you right now you've got Lyme disease it was like the, the, it was like wait until it comes back but I'm, I'm almost certain um tests come back positive for Lyme disease um and all the all the biomarkers of it as well there's certain things in your blood like the CD57 and different inflammation mm -hmm. blood counts and it was it was this it was this strange thing because I was so relieved that all the years that I went and sat in a doctor's office and say, no, there is something wrong with me. And they're like, Ren, we've done so many blood tests and there's nothing wrong with you. It's psychosomatic. It's all in your head. And it was like such an affirming, like, 
thing, but it also made me feel really angry as well because I was like, why didn't somebody take the time to do what this guy did right at the start? Why why did I have to do all this? So I felt a lot of anger for the medical industry, but I also felt so much relief because I finally had an answer. And then I had... find out that it's not as clear cut as you've got Lyme disease, take these antibiotics and you're better because it had been in my body for eight years. So I treated the Lyme disease, I take the antibiotics and I'm just left with like all this autoimmunity and all this like stuff, residual stuff from having an untreated condition for so many years. So like it was a real mixed bag because I had a path to wellness now. That was the great thing. And it gave me a lot more determination. Um, but I also, it, it there was a lot of like resentment there for the years of like medical neglect and, and the times that people with 100% confidence looked at me and were like, Ren, there's nothing wrong with you. So one doctor even said, have you tried getting a hobby while I was like, while I was in the thick of it? And I was, yeah. That's te terrible. Yeah. Yeah. It, wild to wrap, like, like tried to even just wrap your mind around. Yeah, it was, it was surreal. But the good thing was, and then I started blogging about it. I, I kind of got a second wind after that diagnosis because I was like, I am going to get better. There's nothing that's going to stop me. Nothing's going to get my way. I start blogging and um, a stem cell doctor finds the blog. This is something very outside of my fi financial capacity at the time. He he felt a sense of empathy, I guess, because his, his son was a musician. Funnily enough, it was hit right here in LA. He goes, if you can get to yourself to LA, I'll give you a stem cell transplant for free and I guarantee you it's going to make your life a lot better. I f my, bagged my mum for money for flights. She gives me flights. I stay with a family who were going through the same treatment. Funny enough, a set designer for the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, somehow. <laughs> uh, he, just a guy I found on a Facebook group. They're a lovely, lovely couple. Well, um, by the way, like Lyme disease, there's a big community of people who go through it. And yep. I, I, have, I have friends. It's a very, it, it, it's a somewhat common thing yeah. here in America. I know. Yeah, you a lot more a bunch of, in the UK, yeah. Well, and by the way, like if you look back at the traces, I'm pretty sure like it's a profit over people situation where yep. they did pesticides and things that they shouldn't have used. And like there was an uptick in ticks and yep. all these different things that would make its way to people. And mm. I mean, terrible stuff. But if you caught it quick enough with the right dose of antibiotics, exactly. you'd actually be able to mitigate symptoms because the longer it's inside of you, the worse it becomes. That's exactly it. If you take a course of three weeks of doxycycline within the first, I think you've got about a month window. Um, most people make a full recovery. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, like uh, other famous cases of this is like Avril Lavigne. Yeah. 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 Avril Lavigne. I think I, think I heard something about Justin Bieber. Um, you've got, um, uh, what's her name? Um, oh, it's not coming to me now. But yeah, there's, there have been a few cases where celebrities have, have come out and spoke out about it. And it's still, there's still so much misunderstanding about it. Whether it's like, cause, because there's the, in the medical industry, there's still an argument whether is this just post Lyme disease and an autoimmune thing, or is this a chronic infection, whether it's persisting but evading tests, that, um, uh, antibody tests, because of mm. the way that it w operates in your body, it's, it's, it's almost like a stealth bacteria. So, and there's still a big debate about that, which leaves the patient in the middle. And, and I don't even know which side of the fence I sit, but it leaves the patient in the middle without answers and that's the most that's the that's the most difficult thing is the scientific community that you know there's a couple of schools of thought and then and then then you have the patient and the patient is left with no clear answers which is why i think there's a desperate desperate need for more resources to be put into what's actually going on because yeah it's it's it's, it's tough it, the other thing too is like stem cells a big discussion about stem cells mm -hmm. and the ability to use them yeah, those are. I mean, rumor has it in LA they use them for almost everything. Yeah, and uh, like my chiropractor's like, yo, if your shoulder hurts, like let me put like I'll inject you with stem cells. <laughs> right, like, but it it is game changing because of the way mm. it, what it is. I mean, yeah. you're essentially injecting mm. new cells to replace the unhealthy cells. Right, and and yeah, and you know, I was advised against with normal doctors. They were like, nah, just don't go there. You know, it's not it's not researched enough. We're not and um. I took a gamble on it because I had nothing to lose really at the time. I, you know, I didn't think I was going to live to see 30. So I was like, well, you know, the, the, there's this real big opportunity. It felt right. It was one of those things that felt right. And yeah, I, I went and did the stem cell transplant. And um, six months later, um, I just got a lot better. I was I was able to go out singing, playing on the streets, go to the gym, hang out with friends. And it was incredible. But is that scary to do that all again? It was it was very bizarre. I, I just want to do a disclaimer as well and say that some people that did the transplant got worse because, you know, 
I always feel when people are like, do you recommend doing this? I'm always a little bit hesitant because I took a gamble and some people took that gamble and it didn't work out for them. So mm. um, I, th I think it's important for me to say that. But for me, luckily, it worked out. And um, it was, I don't know, it was, <laughs> there was a little, I, I remember there was a little bit of, um, performance anxiety the first few times I went out again because I was like, well, I'm learning how to <laughs> learn how to swim again. Um, yeah, it was it was bizarre, but it, I think I was just so relieved that I just took to it very quickly. And it was very quickly. I think it was only six months after my stem cell transplant that the first video um, that we filmed busking after years and years of not being able to make music videos and stuff, um, this this song Blind Eyed I did with my friend Sam. We went out on the street. We did this video while we were filming. I just did that one, man. Another one, and um, just started videos everywhere from these busking vid sessions. Just started going viral all over the internet, and it was like, oh, damn! Like, because at the time I was I would kind of like surrender the fact was like, oh, I'm 26 now, and you know I had this opportunity when I was 19. I, you know, I just want to do music for me really, and I I, I didn't really know. If there was another chance and and all these videos start popping off and um yeah it was really incredible actually for me yeah at 27 you think you're gonna die but the reality is at 27 you get a whole restart to your career in life yeah that's right yeah and which is it's kind of ironic in it because 27 club it's like the, the the age where most of these uh these uh amazing musicians died uh some, some of the most iconic musicians died at 27 and 27 felt almost like a rebirth for me so that was a nice flip on that. Really special. Yeah. Mm. Is Sick Boy your story? It's not my entire story. It's 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 a it's definitely a photograph of moments. Yeah. Moments that range from when to when. Yeah. Uh, from, uh, just from, from from that whole period, I think you know the the because you've got Sick Boy, the actual song itself. Um, that that's to do with my frustration with uh with certain interactions with different doctors and stuff. Uh, masochist. A masochist is about rebirth for me. It's about samsara. It's it, it, it's that uh, it's that Buddhist cycle of of destroying and that that everything does eventually disappear and everything gets born. It's, it's this constant cycle of destruction and rebirth. Some people took it very literally, and were like, "This isn't masochistic. This is sadistic. You're just talking about killing everything." You know. I just recorded. I just. I mean, today recorded. Um. My reaction to masochist, and I, I took it in a comedic, I, I, it's a pretty comedic reaction, it's not a serious reaction, but uh, it's funny to hear him say that, definitely check that out. Literally, and we're like, this isn't masochistic, this is sadistic, you're just talking about killing everything, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of bold lines in there, um, yeah. but that, you know, they're, they're all metaphors for, for cutting off various ties, and it, it wasn't about being shocking to be shocking, for me that song symbolised... Um, Symbolize rebirth, but in a way that is quite self-destructive by shutting yourself off from everything, which is a tendency that I had to do with my illness because I think the thought of attachment becomes very scary when you're ill and you realize you can just lose everything. I mean, I was attached to the idea that I would be a star at 19 and, you know, that all, that all blew up in my face. And so it's just about severing ties from anything that could cause pain. Um, and that's any hope and dream because it's the the obstacles are too great to overcome. Which is why it can become quite uh, masochistic because, uh, but or, or in in that, that's all right. and and gaining gaining almost like a satisfaction from being the person in control of severing all those ties. I think I think that's one of the things. Yeah, because it, it's you before it's your yeah. illness. You know what I mean? Yeah, and that became a bit of an unhealthy theme in my life. Was like leaning on destructive things because I had the power to choose them rather than my body choosing them because my body was being so destructive in my experience of life. So if I go out one night and smoke a hundred cigarettes in an, in an evening, I've chosen to destruct. I am the person in control of that destruction. But the other destruction is not your choice. Exactly. You and there was something quite it. empowering about it. All right, guys, I had to take a break from the interview. I'm going to put this in the beginning of the video. I, um, Hear, hearing this interview kind of triggered a few things in me that I haven't thought about in a very long time and some things that have been kind of been bothering me for a little bit now. Um, and so I had to kind of take take a step back and, and get my head straight and screwed on. Um, 
I apologize to Zach saying, you know, I was saying, I was saying I didn't like his voice or it was a little annoying and whatnot, but uh, I apologize for that, man. I said what I said, but I do apologize. Um, yeah, as you guys, you know, watch this, you'll, you'll kind of see some of the things that might've been triggered. Um, but for now, um, we're going to keep going with the interview. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving uh, kind of how deep it's going here and you get to really see, um, Ren's thought process behind the songs. And, you know, I, I thought certain, I thought there may have been certain intentions behind, uh, like for instance, high Ren, but, um, you know, he kind of explains his process for it and how it was an old song. And then it was really dark in the end. And then one of his friends said something to him and he's like, you know what, that he's actually got a really good point. So where can I bring the light in? Um, so we're just gonna keep going with the interview here. Um, yeah, I had to I had to clear my head. This is a brand new landscape for me. Uh, brand new landscape doing online things. You know, I've learned to manage my anxiety pretty well just in regular life. Uh, but going into the internet space is a whole new way to navigate. So I'm still figuring out how to navigate, and I'll figure it out. Um, but ultimately, I'm gonna stick with it. Period. Um, you know, I don't care if I make crappy reaction videos for three years straight, eventually I'm going to figure the shit out. So, um, we're going to keep going here, um, with the interview. To destroy, I am the person in control of that destruction. But the other destruction is not your choice. Exactly. You and there was something quite it. empowering about it. being the person that chooses when I destruct. So, so I, I did, I had a, quite a few unhealthy, some, some that I still carry unhealthy coping mechanism just because of that power this feeling of empowerment that I am in control of this destruction. I'm going to be honest, like th having this conversation allows me to see my relationship with my best friend who I lived with for many, many years, uh -huh. navigate the, her terminal illness, right? It was terminal, but it was also chronic, right? Yeah. And um, think actions she would do that were the worst possible decisions get new meaning even from this, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and it is hard when you are someone who wants to do it before your illness does it for you. Yeah. And it's not just hard for you but it's also hard on those who care about you because 100 percent because it, because in, in the old in the long run ultimately it feeds into a into the illness being even worse in some ways if well, I'm, you become your illness too yeah yeah so it's 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 definitely one that i'm trying to find a lot more zen and a lot more balance with i haven't quite mastered the art of that yet but i'm aware of it and i think that's the first step totally yeah um yeah, a song like "The Hunger." You were it definitely um, taking it out on the people that care about you the most. Um, you know, a lot of people with, um, you know, I mean, through through my, I won't talk about other people. Through my um, earlier years, I guess, like like you know, fifteen through about the age of twenty, uh, even even up through about twenty one. I'm twenty seven now. Um, you know, the people that suffered, the, I was I was suffering, but the people who suffered far more than me uh was my family um my parents siblings um they they suffered far i mean i i've since apologized to them um you know i've i've since uh done everything i can to say like i i'm really sorry for all the shit i put you guys through um and i have relationships with everyone now and and it's it's you know it's it's difficult to overcome that um, but the people who suffer the most are the, are the people that care about you. I mean, you, you may think you're, I mean, I thought I was suffering. I felt like I was suffering more than anyone could have ever understood. And to an extent, some of that was true, but in the, at the end of the day, what it ended up doing was hurting the people around me. Um, and that's, that's not something that should be overlooked when we're talking about medical or mental problems or whatever you want to call it birthday in 2015 but why did it fit now um i think at the time i'd wrote it in, in my bedroom when i was just kind of like too too ill to get out and about and it was just a bit like a fun hip-hop track for me but how many songs were you able to write from bed i there's probably about a thousand songs on my hard drives various different in various different stages complete because that's all i could really there was i think there was a there was a period of time where I was unable to do anything at all, really. But most of the time, I was too tired to really leave my room. But what I would do is just sit there with my laptop on. There's a video of patient, called Patience on YouTube, where it kind of it's got a shot where my friend Aisha came over to my house. But that was a period where I'd barely leave my house. But um, my 
I think the thing when I when I could when I was functional enough to be able to, which um, you know, the, the the hours that I was able to, I just that's all I did. I just just write, just produce beats, and just write. So there's a huge uh, catacomb full of music on my hard drives, um, uh, which maybe I'll revisit one day, maybe not. Is but um, have you even attempted to revisit it from a healthy? Yeah, yeah. State? So so I, I released demos one and two, which was a bit of an accumulation of a lot of those songs. I, I just kind of went through a lot of them and go, oh, I like that one. I'll bring that onto life. Oh, I like that one. I bring that onto life. I'm sure I'll probably do that at some point with more demos projects. The the difficulty is when you're an artist releasing things that you've done a while ago is that you feel that you've improved and ha and a different perspective. So you might not completely relate to them. So even though someone else might really like them, it's it's quite a difficult process to put them out if it's not on in a place that you are. I understand that. Yeah. So like even with Sick Boy, are there any songs that you made for this album that at the time of making it mm. meant one thing but today means something else to you? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, hmm. Well, I think Suicide was an obvious, obvious example because that it was never meant to have the end on it. So it, it and mm. after I added the end on, which I did when I was in Calgary, because before I'd, I'd written it about three years before when I was in lockdown. And, um, and that's a tribute. It, yeah, uh, and it wasn't a tribute initially, but the end gives the, the start a whole new meaning, I think, because it, it, then you have it from two different perspectives. You have it from the perspective of the sufferer and the perspective of the person who's actually gone along Suffering. with it and, and carried yeah. it out. So or, um, yeah. that one definitely transformed. Yeah. Is that? Wow. It, yeah. Yeah, no, but 100%, man. Is that a strategy for you creatively that you write songs from two different perspectives that you cap capture in one story? I wouldn't say strategy is the right word. No, it, it it just it just what happened. I think it just it just happened to be uh, for for me like songwriting is quite a spiritual thing, and and it it, it it um it almost kind of feels like channeling at some point. It's just something that's already there, which which is why I think I sometimes find it quite difficult to take compliments for for it because it doesn't really feel like mine once it's done. Um, so it was um. Yeah. Wait. It almost kind of feels like channeling at some point. It's just something that's already there, which which is why I think I sometimes find it quite difficult to take compliments for for it because it doesn't really feel like mine once it's done. Mm, um, okay. So it was. Um, yeah, th th I don't think I ever go into songs strategically. So how do you know you've entered a state where you can accept that King Dada beef <laughs> receive? And by the way, like that is a common mm. thing, right? Yeah. Like. Chris Martin believes that all of his best songs are given to him by the universe, mm -hmm. and you know he sold the story here twice. Like that is super common. Like you yeah. enter this thing that you don't even, you can't even fully explain. Yeah. So it's it's, it's kind of some because sometimes it's like all the words and the rhymes and everything are there. It's strange. It, it feels like with with lots of things in life, there's a conscious. I'll do this to get this result. Mm. But sometimes with music, it's like, and, and which is why it, it sometimes doesn't feel like mine. It's like I'm not actually doing. I'm just taking. Um, and you're, and ta it, you're taking from you though, or taking from something bigger, or a combination of the two. I'll let it play. I don't know. Maybe, maybe like you could argue for the both. It could just be like a subconscious, sub perceptual thing where you've written so many lyrics that it just your brain is working behind the surface, or or, or maybe it could be some some more esoteric type thing. Um, I yeah, I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, so he mentions in high rent, you know, he mentions the Eminem battle with the guilty conscience, the plan B and, and having that back and forth. This is like, this isn't, um, it, it, it's definitely, um, the mark of like an emotionally intelligent, uh, artist. I mean, you see this in a lot of different music where you have the duality and you have not just the duality of like, Oh, I can do good and evil, but also just the voice of like, Exactly like Ren said, like the the over doubting and the overconfident, and then the confident, and then the you know slightly doubtful, self doubtful. Um, yeah. So I I almost I almost feel like I don't know maybe Ren was trying to go with like well you know I have to battle with because I mean for me I draw inspiration from people like Ren, people like Eminem, um, uh, Royce the Five Nine. There's this guy Chester P in the in the UK, one of the best poets I've I've ever speak poetry out of his, like a human being's mouth i mean he is phenomenal like i draw inspiration from other people and so certainly when i write i i struggle with that self-doubt of like 
man, how much of this is me just copying what they're doing or like slightly modifying it or, and I don't mean lyrical content, but I mean just stylistically, like the flow, the rhyme pattern, the 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 topics, you know, not not like word for word taking it and just tweaking it so I can say it's mine. I just, and so I, I think maybe that's that's kind of more what Ren might might have been going with. I'm not sure though. I'm not really sure. Do you care to even know, or do you just let it? Whatever. Nah, happens, I don't really happens. care enough to know. I, I, th I think I don't. I don't really need to understand it. it. Just kind of like I don't really need to understand why I'm here. I think. I think. Um, my favorite. My favorite thing that I've keep referring to recently is that the end of one of those Bill Hicks shows before he died. I lo love Bill Hicks, man. Mm. Where it was just like it's just a ride, just a ride, man. Just. You know, it's it, things. Terrible things may happen, but the, the the purpose and the point I think is to be to enjoy the ride and 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 try and make it as an enjoyable ride for everybody else who's sitting next to you as well. Why was Loco produced the way it was? Uh, just again, just for fun, man. I I, I like the challenge of just doing some. Man, I love that. Um. Like what, you know, like, because oftentimes as fans of artists, we, we read into everything. And sometimes like the artist might just be like, man, I, you know, I just want to have fun with it. I mean, he talked about drugging monkeys. I had a bit like a comedy bit I did about that throughout the movie or throughout the song. Um, definitely worth potentially checking out, by the way. Um, shameless self-promotion. But um, yeah, man, because oftentimes as, as fans, like you get so immersed in the music and then sometimes you'll read in things that aren't necessarily meant to be interpreted. Um, but, you know, art is interpretive in that way. So who's to say you, you can't, you know, you feel free to interpret how you want. But it is interesting to hear the artist's perspective on, on like how he interacts with music. Um, let's keep going, man completely acapella and I, I grew up uh it's something I like to revisit something but I used to be obsessed with beatboxing when I was a teenager and I used to um I used to just love it I think it helped with my flows as well because you've got like when you have those rhythmical flows it's almost like a, it's like a you've got that kind of like you've you've got this so you can hear counter melodies because you've got you've yeah. got the hi-hats the snares the cymbals in the words yeah, so when I'm writing having that kind of because rap, rap is a bit like a drum kit. I, I always see like singing is a uh, singing is like a cello. I think the cello is the closest thing to the human voice. The, the singing is an instrument, and rapping for me is a drum kit. And you can accent mm. certain. Mm. So if I'm like a, I get like, and then I'm like, I put words to that, and it's like when I am a rolling this over that on the rolling with. So I actually look at rap as an instrument. Like the whole genre is, is in, I view it as an instrument. I don't necessarily view it as, I, I view, like I've almost started to view, so I, it, that's interesting to hear his perspective in that regard, but I definitely see that in his music because he'll, um, you know, he has the rhythmic flows and, and the flows are almost perfect with the, uh, with the beat um, in that regard. And then he'll switch it up and it's a different interaction with the beat, but it is almost he, like he's rapping like a hi-hat, um, like he says, but um, the way I, I look at rap is a little bit different, but that's definitely interesting to hear his perspective on that. And then and kind of put in more and, and then and then consolidate into words. And I think that really helped with my flow because you can do some really interesting things with triplets, counter rhythms and oh, it's more straight fall to the floor patterns. And um, yeah, so so with Loco, I just wanted to build a track that was totally from the voice. How do you determine which story deserves which type of sonics and vocal mm. performance? I, I think that just comes back to the other thing as well. I usually start with a with a either a drum loop or a, a melodic loop or a guitar pattern, right? Mm. And um, that really kind of infers the feeling. It, I'll, I'll find something that I really like. I'm just playing around on a on a keyboard or my guitar or whatever. I find something that I really like, and that almost like puts me into this feeling of what the song should be about. And then sometimes I'll just write stream of consciousness. I'll just write until I find the theme and I stumble across it accidentally, then I'll get rid of all of the things that I've written and then, and then write again that, that yeah. fits inside that theme. Because for me, it's like mm. finding the seed of the concept makes the lyric writing process so much more fluid. Wow. I get that. Yeah. What are you thinking, Dan? Well, I was going to uh, ask how you rap so fast. On <laughs> Shoot, there was another guy there the whole time. 
<laughs> oh wow. The song's like wicked waste, but I think you just answered that question. Yeah, well, it's partly that, and it's and it's a lot of coming back to the hyperfixation. It's a lot of um, just repetition. I'll, I'll start with the metronome on like 100 BPM, and then I'll pump it to 110, then I'll pump it to 120, and I'll just keep on. For some reason, I never get bored of doing things. I could stay there for an hour, <laughs> saying the same line over and over and over again, and um, I, I just don't. I don't seem to get. I find it quite meditative. I don't really get bored or. Even if I'm walking to the shops, I'll do it. Or if I'm on the bus, I'll do it. Just any time that's like free real estate to practice, I'll practice just because it's, I might as well. Otherwise, I'm just there thinking about, I don't know, and anything, anything. So it's just, it's, it's really good opportunity to be able to just kind of improve that on that. So, I, and I, that's what I like about the, I, what I love is if I've got an idea in my head and I try and do it and I can't do it because I'm like, oh, I'll be able to do that soon. And then that will, push my ability level to this new foundational place. And then when it comes to the next thing, I can try and up it yet again. So, um, yeah, yeah, I really like doing that. Why do you, why is giving the lyrics super fast vital to the way that that song needs to come off? It's, I don't think it's vital. And actually with, with time, I've actually, I think I was a lot more excited. I mean, I grew up listening to people like Skibbity, who was like a UK drum and bass MC and um, some of the old, uh, I mean, all, obviously like the Buster Rhymes and, 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 um, and people like that, but I really, I just liked how it made me feel, but I don't believe in doing it for the sake of doing it in such of like a flex sort of way, because I think mm. there are so many amazing artists that do that. You I mean, you've got like the Tech Nines. Um, Tech and, Nine. Yeah, yeah, and-, and, and Twister. And Twister, hell yeah. Um, and and, and uh, it's, it, for me, it's not about being the fastest, really. It's, a, it's it's just about sprinkling it in places that makes it sonically yeah. interesting because it's I, it's like flavor, you know. It's like seasoning. It's it's like you add you add. Oh, I could use a little pepper, you know. That I, yeah. It, it's the same with my production. There's there's a danger at one point where you can become a bit too overindulgent in that, mm. and and you drown it in too much of that stuff. But for me now, with time, it's being like, okay, this little moment. We'll just raise an intensity if I bring this in here. So, um, yeah, but I do enjoy it. I do enjoy it. Mm. Illus of our time, a double entendre. Yeah, pretty good. Great record. Thank you, mate. Thank you. I mean, is there a part of you that is, I mean, embraces one? I mean, I don't. It's not making light of it, but it's embracing it, right? Yeah, it's understanding what you got. Well, that's, that's the, the thing, honor. and it's the same, same with Sick Boy. It's a double. It's a, the whole album is a double entendre. One of the great challenges in this world is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right. Is it, you know, in the hip hop illest, sick. Is sick, bruv, is like, you know, it's, uh, it, it means good, and, and, but sick, sick as in illest as well. It's, it's my story, man. So, um, yeah. Uh, and I suppose it's the first time I thought about that, but there's, there's a little bit of, uh, there's a bit of duality in that as well, in terms of you can take good out of the sick. You know, it's true. Yeah. What's the story behind a song like "Down on the Beat"? Is that just you just wanting to have fun? Yeah, that's me wanting to make a dance banger, bro. I want, it, yeah, it, it yeah. worked. Yeah, I, I, I just um, you know, I mean, I, I shout out to Victus, man. Go check out. I've been saying it. Go check out his channel. I, I really want him to keep doing music, because the beginning stages are always, you know, say what you want. The beginning stages are always rough. I mean. They're hard for an artist, those beginning stages, and then you put it out and you get critique and you get, I mean, you can get in your head really easily, but, um, you know, I even emailed him. I emailed him and I was like, you know, I, I'm not going to say what I said, but I said some things and, um, you know, I go check out his channel, show some love, show some support because I, I see with, with the struggle that he's overcome, he's going to be able to do some great things if he decides to stick with it for sure. Dave. Funnily enough, probably the music I listen to most is like EDM, which doesn't really come across <laughs> my music because I'm either singing soul on the streets or making hip hop. But I, I love I love dance music, man. And I, I love I, when I first started producing, I, I just wanted to be a drum and bass producer. That was like I was like, that's all I want to do, because all I would listen to was drum and bass and like really techy, like dark drum and bass, which probably wasn't good for my mental state at the time. But um, I just like. Yeah, I think that was just I wanted to make a dance banger, and there wasn't there wasn't too much. I mean, you've listened to the record. There's not too much depth in that or anything, but it's just fun. And um, it was my, my mate, mate Vic as well. We were both like freestyling to a dance beat one night, one time, and um, and we were like, we should make a track. And we're like, oh yeah, let's make a track. So we, that's what we did. We just we just like got this EDM beat and and put down the beat together. Yeah. Does your hyperfixation apply to Animal Farm? Um. 
or socialism? It, it, or communism? I, I was always... What's the deal? I wouldn't, I wouldn't, <laughs> that's a good point. That That's a good question. I wouldn't say... No, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it applies to socialism or communism. I think I think with my view on those, uh, I, I think there are good elements. Well, I mean, it plays into the NHS. It plays into the health thing. Hundred uh, percent. And, and, and I, I think well, it plays into every system, and every system, to a degree, will lean more into a particular thing. But even even America, there are that, there are elements of socialist socialism in america i think we it's one of those black yeah, and white things again where yeah. if you slightly hint at it people will be like but communism doesn't work socialism thank god dude i love red man i love red because the question you know it's the question is slightly meant to be it, it's inquisitive but it's also provocative and especially in the u.s people get really worked up about politics so I, i'm gonna love what he's about to say i already know it it's black and white things again where if you slightly hint at it people will be like but communism doesn't work socialism doesn't work because this example a b c d and and i think i think there is a lot of beautiful amazing things about capitalism as well so i wouldn't say yeah. i was a socialist or a communist or a capitalist i think i think all of them have um weaknesses and strong points and some of them get abused I don't think it's the fault of the systems themselves. I think it's the fault of the the people the who people. are abusing those oh systems. Oh my god, dude! Thank you. Like, I I wish I wish you like I wish we could go into like you. It doesn't seem like you can do this in the U.S. I wish we could just ingrain this that it's like, guys, it's like because because exactly what he said. People just go right into it, man. They get so worked up. Socialism or capital, you know, capitalism's evil. Like, ev like communism's evil it's like man okay what's the factor that is in each one of those things people and greed and power and so yeah i mean i you know i i definitely like it's something that's decentralized makes sense because you'd at least theory in theory i know people get in the comments but in theory you would have more checks and balances i'll i'll let ren talk here man I don't think it's the fault of the systems themselves. I think it's the fault of the, the people who are abusing those systems that turn them into the negative things that they are. I think beautifully I th said. I, th I think yeah, that hundred percent. I think that having a base level of housing um, and healthcare, because we have the capacity as human beings to offer that, should be done. Um, and then Thank we can God, still man. have a system yeah. where people are proportionally rewarded for their efforts, which is more of a capitalist model. But I also think that since the internet has come about, there's probably an even better one than all of them that we just haven't quite figured out what to, what to, how to do it yet. Because I, I, oh. I personally think that the voting system is outdated. I think that there's a much better way to make democratic decisions with the power of collective intelligence from the internet because there's a huge there's a huge world and there's a huge number of people who are cap capable of making decisions. So you don't really necessarily need an electoral body to represent a whole country that then cyclically gets put in charge. I think, I think it's, I honestly think it's a completely outdated system that's maintained by the power systems and the money that, that keep them alive. So, um, but that doesn't mean to say that. Thank God for Ren, man. I could not agree more. I'm an anarchist either because um, I do believe that there are some people that are more suited to a leadership role and there are some people that don't want that role. So so to create total chaos, I think people naturally form hierarchy, but hierarchy doesn't necessarily need... Today is the 23rd of November 2023 and Gaza is still under the fire and... Man, I'm getting such heavy ads on this. Normally it's just like, you know, some of it's like the the cast. You know, like I don't know. I'd be getting these weird like princess castle ones or whatever. But some of these ads, I just get I get really heavy ones. I'm like, man, I feel terrible for skipping this. But anyway, be negative as long as social good is That's it. as long as social good is at the top of the hierarchy before profit, before power, before uh, expansion. And, um, and also homeostasis of the world that we live in because this is this is the one place that we've been given to be able to coexist and we're doing a pretty good job of like uh, of messing it up uh, and, and and a lot of data is showing that so um uh, and then you get to a point where you have scientific arguments about the climate and no matter what side of the fence you sit if you think that it's a big hoax or if you if you're agreeing um with certain scientists are saying that we're in doomsday prophecy situations both of which i think are maybe a little over exaggerated i think that 
I think that um, the fact that we can't have healthy mediated conversations about these things because there are profit incentives and investments from either side. And, and that is uh, like here. Here's the deal. And mm. I can I can have the conversation about like collective intelligence helping make decisions for a governing body and yep. allowing that to at least give you a temperature check of like where you should be going and the legislation that's right and etc. Like we, I, I would love to talk about that. Yeah. But I think first and foremost, like the, you have to inject. A moral filter through every single decision and action a government body will 100%. ever make. Yeah. In addition to that, the foundational mandate across everything mm. needs to be people over profit. A hundred percent. And the idea that people are the a nation, a state, a city, a town's greatest asset. Mm. And without people, nothing will ever fucking work. Yeah. And, and the, the, the difficulty is. Is our is a per? I mean, you know, Animal Farm. All absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, I mean, do, do we make an AI? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because are you going to be able to find a human who is truly genuine and and humble enough to be able to make those calls and not let that power go to their head? I don't know. I mean, like, man, if I was given a billion dollars and like, hey, you're president of the United States tomorrow, ooh, that would be rough. That would like, I can't, I don't know what I would do, but I mean, you know, there's, there's, it's a difficult question, but it's like, man, what, what are you like? Do we make an AI in charge? Like, do you, I'm not suggesting this, but I am saying it's like, man, what is the neutral like what could you can't program goodness into a human we've i you know i don't think that's i don't think it's possible but you don't want an ai in charge of course so what what is that next system and i i don't know i mean it's certainly I won't speak too much, but I, you know, certainly uh, there are elements of socialism, which I mean, like, especially in the U.S., there's so much money here. There's so much infrastructure. There's so many jobs. There's so much food, food, housing and health care there. there sh it should be accessible to everyone. Like it, it to me, it's kind of insane to say, like, it shouldn't be accessible to everyone. That being said, once just like Ren, um, there are great elements of capitalism. Absolutely. So it's. Yeah, it's it's that difficult predicament, and I don't know what the next the next step in in humanity systems are. Um, in the larger, the other thing too is is like if you have a small community, it's easier to come up with a system that everyone agrees with, and that works for everyone or most people. Um, when you have very large countries and large divert, like it's a lot more difficult. I mean, look at the EU. You know, you have people in Britain who, you know, they, they left the EU because they felt like they were getting screwed. You have people in Europe currently who feel like they're being screwed. You have people who love um, the, the system that the EU provide. Like, you, you have all these different varying opinions. And the larger you try to um, put a power system in place, the, the more resistance it's going to get and the more difficult it is to come up with the, with, uh, the most effective solution. But this is part of humanity is saying like, Hey, what's the problem? It's like, man, if you have a coworker and you just, you keep catching some attitude, the best thing to do is not go straight to HR. The best thing to do is hit like pull aside and say like, Hey, can we, can we talk for a second and be vulnerable, be willing to say like, I'm wrong. Or, you know, I didn't know that, like be willing to do that. And if you're able to do that more often than not, people are at least reasonable enough usually to have a conversation. And then after, you know, if you can do that, and then after that, you know, say the person goes off and starts talking crap about you, then it's like, okay, well then maybe you should explore other options. But it seems like um, the extreme response is, is um, and maybe it's just social media and the internet making it seem like it, but I do feel like the extreme response is, is the first response more so than the reasonable one in some cases, maybe. I don't know. I'm not a philosopher, man. The ironic thing is, I think if, if that shift, which is a very, very foundational and significant shift, if that were to happen, the people at the top in power, the ironic thing, I think they would be happier anyway. And, and, and I think there's this this desperate protection of trying to maintain this system because it's really working out well for the people who've got a lot of money and power. So there's a desperate need to protect it. But I think with that with that shift, if it's done in the right way, everyone, even those people who have got that's it, perception everything. 
actually get happier too. And, and really, I know it's a very simple thing, but happiness is really what it's all about. Oh, dude. Yeah. In America, for instance, I believe that talent is equally distributed in this country, but opportunity isn't. So much is made up by your zip code and where you happen to live and the bubble that's around you. Mm. Uh, on top of that, I do also believe that selfishness can breed selflessness and selflessness can breed selfishness. Yeah. Because the uh, ability mm. to run for office and bring about a better day for your family should in turn bring a, about a better day for your neighbors mm. when when done right. Yeah. Historically, greed gets in the way, mm -hmm. and you have mm -hmm. situations where, like, just like let's look at a microcosm of America real quick, and let's take a trip to Florida where you find Marco Rubio, who his district has the Parkland shooting uh, years back on Valentine's Day. Uh, you know, he, he he decided to sell sell the children of his district to the NRA mm -hmm. while taking money from the NRA. Right? He sold the kids, and he used that money to put his kids into private school. Right? Yeah. Instead of saying like, let me build upon a better reality for. So I, I'm. You guys let me know what he's talking about. This is the first I'm hearing about it. Um, I try to stay away from news, politics. Like, I try to stay away from all of it. Um, I like to, like, th like think and analyze things by myself. Um, but you guys give me into what he's selling selling kids or his kids to the NRA. So you guys let me know what he's talking about there. That might have put his kids into private school, right? Yeah. Instead of saying, like, let me build upon a better reality for everybody yeah, um, and make school safe for everybody, mm. uh, he chose to take the real deeply selfish route. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, ultimately, like, and, and, and it's, kids and it's, die. And it's, I think it's so difficult to, you know, even myself and, and, and everybody, for those virtues to not, be tainted and it's not necessarily our fault for being totally selfish it's just a, like it's a bombardment of our entire environment inspires us to be that way because it, it's 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 everywhere from mm. the moment we enter school to media to everything so it's really about like for me i try and try not to point too many fingers and and just try and see it in myself and, and, and try and inspire that change in whatever way i can even in conversations like this but um, that's such a hard thing to do, man. That's something I, I actively struggle if in that's something I actively struggle with is is I mean, man, in the beginning of this, I, I came in with a certain attitude. And I mean, I was poking fun at Zach's voice. I was like, eh, it's a little, you know, whatever. But in, in, on a more serious note, like, I, I do struggle with pointing fingers a lot. Um, and, and that's something with that everyone struggles with if, if they're being honest with themselves. And so props to Ren for at least saying, like, that's something, you know, I, I'm trying to... Because um, there are obvious things, like bad things that happen where it's, it's easy to say, oh, this person did something wrong. And for some reason, that gives us, like, some kind of righteous feeling about ourselves. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily know what that is, but I do know people like to do it. I know I like to do it. Um, and that's a, a character flaw I've recognized and I'm, you know, I'm working on it. <laughs> Lord knows I, I, ain't, I ain't perfect and I never will be. Um, but props to Ren for, for at least recognizing that and, and, exp you know, going a little bit deeper than like, oh, Marco Rubio's a POS. It's like, well, he's a politician, but, you know, going a little bit deeper to like, um, the, the way, the way that he looks at other people in the world and, um, the mistakes that are made that even if they're obvious, interesting. And try and inspire that change in whatever way I can, even in conversations like this. But, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's a foundation of everything. If there is some way to put social good uh, across profit and, and that to be the, like, the some way, foundational, yeah. I think we can still live in a world, world of profit. Oh my God. You, know? you, have, you have no idea how much i mean everybody has an idea but nobody fully understands the i, I mean the egregious spending that goes on mm. the insane ridiculous redundancies the i mean there's no tracking of money mm. right like when you pay i'm sorry i i do find i do a little i enjoy comedy but he said the insane ridiculous redundancies that's a funny just say that a few times and then you'll you'll catch why that's f a funny thing to say hey a government pays a contractor to do anything from like uh, fucking do the trash to pave the roads there's no understanding of where that money goes once it hits them so yeah. there's like this i mean it's so deeply corrupt mm. it's so deeply corrupt everybody was like you know uh crypto is going to be the future Nah, blockchain is the future as a form of payment because you need to have accountability for where, where pennies go right mm -hmm. so like an understanding of where money's traveling the second like it goes from 
us as taxpaying citizens into the government's hands and out. There's just no understanding. So the second that it goes out to a contractor, it could be spent a trillion different ways. And by the way, it's never being used on anything that's going to do good for people. Right. Like, all, like really, if you were to go in and audit everything, the amount of money that is being spent on things that are probably non-existent right. is, could be in the billions, if not trillions at all. Yeah, yeah. And, and then profit and people just spending money for the sake of tax brackets. Oh, yeah, like, yeah, and there's so much money that could be used for good that's just being spent because they're like, oh, crap, well, we're going to lose lose out this money on tax. We better just buy some shit we don't need. And that's the problem, man. It's like I do think that at the end of the day, people yeah. can be rich and everybody can have a better yeah. day and be taken care of. And there can still be a hierarchy that makes sense while making sure that nobody ever wants for anything. Everybody has access to mental and physical health care. Yeah. There's an understanding that nobody deserves to starve in this nation or live and raise a family of four on something that could barely keep the fucking lights on. Like, everybody deserves access to yeah. internet. Everybody deserves access to reproductive health. Everybody deserves access equal. Like, yeah. genuinely, like, I'm the crazy motherfucker that goes, like, take the best school system in the country and duplicate it everywhere because... If you don't invest in that, you're not investing in anything. Mm. I, th I think school is one of the most important places as well because that is what's shaping the minds of the people that, that, that are taking care of it when, when we're not here, when we're just dust. So I think school is, is one of the most important places to kind of put that energy and focus. But it's a world I want to live in, man. It's, yeah. You're very special. Like you, you really uh, give incredible energy. But your story is really uh, rather remarkable, dude. Let me ask you a question that may relate to what you guys were just talking about. Sure. What does the pig mask represent? It is. It is Animal Farm. And, and yeah, Animal Farm. So yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I was. And coming back to your. If you guys haven't read it, definitely worth checking out. In back to schools, it should be. You know, you should read. All the, like there are definitely books that should be read mandatory in school, and I think that's one of them. I don't know, like I'm not, I'm not super educated. Um, I come from a family of educators, so I learned how to think. But as far as education, I, I, I'm not educated. But definitely, Animal Farm is one of the books for sure. Question as well. I was a, a huge dystopian literature fan growing up. I don't know why. Ever since I was a kid, I was just really. Attracted to that. I felt I watched the Zeitgeist movie when I was about 14 years old. I don't know if you ever watched Zeitgeist, but that no. that blew my mind. And then I, I became obsessed with reading Aldous Huxley, George Orwell, Kurt mm. Vonnegut, people like this, and um, and and that really leaked into my. Aldous Huxley had um, man, what is the book? You guys drop it in the comments. I'll pin it. I I know. I've re I've read that. No, I I audio booked it. Anyway, we'll keep going. Hey, of how I was viewing the world and and um, Animal Farm, yeah, it's, it's, it's the story of of um uh, of these these natural hierarchies that we form and, and how the animals were subject to fall for a brave new world, a brave new world. Falling just how the humans were, and um the pig for me, the pig mask uh, that kind of pops up in those things, it, 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 it it's almost like an uncomfortable companion, um who represents a lot of things. He represents greed. He represents my illness. But he's also so familiar in all of those situations that it's mm. like the thing that I am frustrated with and have been at war with, he's been there for so long that he's also my friend in a way. Or, you know, like Donnie Darko movie where mm. you've got the rabbit there and he's like, he's an ominous character, but he's also a comforting kind of character for Donnie and that. And um, mm. it, it, it's kind of like that really. It's like, like this, this, this thing that is always there with me on this journey that I that is fucking my life up but at the same time um there's a comfort in there because without him and it's, it's a funny one to, to to think about if i was just to wake up tomorrow and i was we didn't have to wake up and swallow a bunch of pills and i was just 100 percent well it'd be it'd, it'd be a surreal obviously it'd be great but it would be a very surreal transition to not have that familiarity of just like even now i'm sat here and my my shins are hurting, my feet are hurting. Um, it's mm. to not have that familiarity when it's all that I've known. Because I don't even really remember what it's like to feel completely healthy. So it's 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 bizarre because um, there's a weird comfort in it uh, at the same time as being a discomfort. I totally understand that. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, I mean, for a bunch of different reasons. Primarily, it's an escape. It's a reason. It's an excuse. But also, it's like, it's a reservoir it's a known, as yeah. well. It's a reservoir of of um, of material, I suppose. I don't know. It's, oh, that's it's interesting. Strange. Yeah, yeah. It fuels this. Yeah, it fuels the album that you can listen to right now. It's waiting for you on Amazon Music. It's called Sick Boy. Uh, all of Ren's music, by the way, is waiting for you on Amazon Music. There's going to be a link in the description below.
What are you thinking? I did want to ask, with like all the treatments and medication, does that affect your brain and how you like create or see different things? A hundred percent, man. And sometimes it can be quite debilitating. I mean, it's why, I mean, I was holding off on the heavier part of the treatment I'm doing in Canada. I haven't done it yet because we had this album coming out and I was like, I don't want to, and it's a funny one because then you're having to like almost, not sacrifice, but you're having to put at certain times, ask the question, do I not lean into this so heavily? So I'm... I held off on a big course of antibiotics that I'll be starting in a couple of weeks um, because I know for the fact that my brain is going to go to mush for a, mm -hmm. a few weeks. And um, But when you become aware of it, it's easier to navigate because I've you know, I've had a, over a decade of messing around with allopathic medicine, so I've come to know how I react. But yeah, there are some times where the first three months of this year, just in a dream world after starting all the, these new treatments and stuff, and I wasn't able to really create during that time. And this is in uh, still on the journey of curing or to the best of your ability managing Lyme disease yeah 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 I mean Lyme disease is theoretically out of my system now um as per the test and as per the test of what Dr. Hoffman the doctor I'm seeing has, has said um the there's a, a there's an active co-infection called Bartonella that's still in my body that's picking up on the antibody so we're treating that with antibiotics um which is a four because it's been in my body for so long we're, we're doing a four month course of antibiotics mm. i mean and it's about three different antibiotics at once so it's going to be heavy and it's going to be not so great on the stomach um but it you know it's a necessary evil and and hopefully after that it there'll be another level of health that i've that i've reached and uh, and hopefully one that i'm um uh, it's really funny, uh, like, w with these chronic infections, because your immune system's not really dealing with them, you go through this thing called the Herxheimer reaction, which is, like, it's it's the, all these bacteria dying off and you release inflammation in your body. So um, it just basically makes... I, I don't know if you guys have ever had COVID, but you get super foggy in your head, and it's like that constantly, basically. You just get super foggy, and, like, your personality gets blunted and just become a bit of a walking dead. <laughs> hey, you can't... You can't be on a promo run promoting an album. Exactly, like man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I get emotional about stupid things. And yeah, yeah. So um, I, I I thought, you know what? I'm going to enjoy this album coming out. And that's <laughs> what I've done, man. Last week was mint, mate. We just like, we went out to Banff. We did some partying. Um, you should be very proud. Guys. Yeah, I feel, I feel super proud. It's, it's really nice, the fact that we've done this pretty much independently as well and having all the people involved in that team because it felt like a real shared celebration, you know, like we were all, we were all buzzing, we were all out there. We went, went and got the biggest steak in the world because <laughs> um, my diet's super limited. So um, that's one of the rare things I can eat in a restaurant. So we got this 40-ounce tomahawk steak, which I like... Uh, tried to finish and was in a lot mm. of pain, but the best sort of pain. And then, um, <laughs> and <laughs> it was good. It was good. It was a, yeah, it was it was a good experience. And then um, we've come here, do things like this, speak to lovely people like yourself and yourself. And then, um, and then we're heading to Vegas on Friday to experience that. Sick. Yeah. Enjoy it all. I will. I will. Appreciate your honesty and your artistry and the vlogs that you put out and your honesty here today. I really do. Um, I appreciate. I appreciate for having on and chatting to me. Yeah. The studio is always open. As you release albums, please come back. I will. And I will. again, all of Ren's music is waiting for you. Link in the description below. It's all on Amazon Music. Final thoughts? Can you tour? So, at the moment, uh, what I'm thinking for the future, I don't think. I think realistically, uh, it's always going to have to be something I manage. Even if I get to a really good place, it's going to have to be something I always look after myself. Sort of. I don't imagine I'll ever go on like sixty-day tours around mm. the world. But what I would like to do, and I was talking to talking to Connor about this, uh, like, you know, maybe go and do like a really big show in a city, stay in that city for a week, soak up the city, just like yeah. take at that pace, and then move on to the next one, and kind of almost do it you like that. You can do that. It's, yeah. it's, cool. it's going to cost you more money, but you can do it. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I, and, I, and I think that there'll be a way to figure it out. And and even with busking and stuff like that, there are things that we can do surrounding that that make it, you know, financially worthwhile. And um, and then just uh, interviews in the cities or, or, or whatever. There, oh, there's, totally. There's definitely ways we can make it work, but I think. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that he's gonna be like hurting uh it, not financially anyway if he stays a week in his city i think ren will be okay <laughs> all right guys i just had the stepdaughter walk in but we'll finish up here yeah uh, i think that's you know un unless it could happen uh, kids really like uh, just bring joy to your soul man uh, what i've learned in this year is fucking anything could happen man we said sitting off the back of a number one album that I never expected. So, <laughs> so um, you know, maybe my health makes a 360 and I'm buzzing and, I'm, uh, and I've got the energy of a 19-year-old and I want to tour the world every single day. But we'll see, man. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just taking everything 
I've taken everything as it comes, but um, you do it at your pace. Yeah, exactly. But I can only imagine, like, as a busker, like, who who knows that high and that feeling, like, mm. you know, to not perform. In that. Oh no, I'm, I'm definitely. You won't be able to keep me off the stage. I'm definitely. <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely gonna do some shows and 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 yeah, and I'm really excited now. It's like now that there's stuff to play with, like we can be really ambitious with the shows that we put on as well. So I'm really excited to put together like a sick experiential show that incorporates elements of the the more sort of like performative stuff like high end and the tales of Jenny and Screech and then oh, the more wow. sort of hip hop stuff. I think we can have a lot of fun putting together something quite special. You give timeless man. Mm. Oh, I appreciate you. Yeah, you're uh, really incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You good? Yep. Ren everybody. Mm. Wow. Yeah, man. That's pretty cool. Um I won't bang on here too much. I might I might do if you guys want to see it, I'll do um some more interviews. They they definitely take up more time, so we'll have to kind of schedule them out, but um you guys let me know if you'd be interested in me reacting and um yeah, I mean you you'll kind of see through, you know, if you watch this full video, the beginning of the video and and um you know, I I was I was pretty anxious today and um got some things going on so I kind of carried that into it and I, I kind of needed to step back and um, get some perspective before continuing and so I'm glad I did that man it was hard to because I wanted to just finish it and get it done with but um, I definitely needed to take a second so um, yeah I'll wrap this one up um, yeah thank you